Welcome everyone to the inaugural uh, Brooklyn Quant Experience. So uh, we renamed the lecture series to the BQE. And um, we're very pleased today to uh, have uh, Malin Sharma, who I've known for a very long time. Um, and that's because he's got actually 24 years of market experience. So it looks like he and I started around the same time. Um, but um, he's been running uh, prop desks at uh, RBC, so Royal Bank of Canada, and Deutsche Bank, the Saba unit, if you uh, live through the credit crisis, or in the London Whale, you know what I'm talking about. So um, he's also um, been in hedge funds like Quant Z and mutual funds, um, not to mention his FinTech venture, uh, QMIT. So his funds have won many awards over the years, including those from Morningstar, Lipper, WSJ, who's the Wall Street Journal, Battle of Quant, and Battlefin. He's also a co-founder of Quant Strategies at uh, what is now BlackRock and manager of the Risk Analytics and Research Group at Ernst & Young, where he was a co-architect of the Raven which is trademark. Um, he's had publications appear in many journals such as Risk, Journal of Investment Management, uh, and publications by Selvier, World Scientific, Wiley, etc. And um, has a dual MS degree, uh, which I believe, which is from um, Carnegie Mellon in um, the computational finance one and also logic AI. Um, you're in the logic AI PhD program uh, there. And um, other education includes Oxford, Vassar, and Wharton. So quite a distinguished background. So we're very fortunate to have Willie here. And let's give him a round warm of applause. A warm, warm of applause. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Carr. Um, it's a great uh, pleasure and a privilege to be speaking amongst all of you. And uh, you know, of course, having had the pleasure of knowing uh, such distinguished academics and great source of inspiration. So let me get started without further ado because um, I guess it's six of my vision and we have uh, plenty of time. All right, um, from, from the video standpoint, do you want me kind of more in the middle? Is that what you said? Uh, just within this area. Okay, yeah. in this area. So not quite at the podium. Fine. Yeah. All right, um, okay, so what we're gonna talk about, uh, you know, this is more of a high level talk. If you wanna uh, ask, uh, please feel free to stop me. It's a small audience if you wanna get more technical stuff. But uh, we'll, we'll start with, maybe I should make this sort of full page or something. Do that. Uh, yeah, there. Okay. <clears throat> all right. So, uh, well, let's start at the very beginning. I could go all the way back to Alan Turing and Bletchley Park and all of that stuff, but we'll start with her Simon because uh, you know, he's from Carnegie Mellon, so I'm biased. And um, I'll just give you like five slides on on uh, uh, sort of AI machine learning as a segue into a natural the talk is called uh, quantum mental in the age of machine learning. So. Um, you know, uh, so I'll start with a little bit of that and then segue into what's happening in finance these days and specifically how we look at it. And uh, even though we're doing fairly simple stuff like factor investing, hopefully you might find some of that uh, interesting. Okay, so, well, uh, it really all began in 1956 with the logic theorist, which was sort of a seminal paper on, uh, on, on essentially what you would call the theory you're improving now. And, and that's the uh, uh, the type of stuff that I was trying to do at the time in, in, in the uh, early 90s, and uh, uh, that's basically uh, what what um, you know got Simon and all of this stuff happening with with the first 38 theorems from uh, Russell Sprinkipia. And as uh, Professor Carr knows, of course, uh, Herb Simon was a man of many talents. Uh, <clears throat> also got a Nobel Prize in economics, <laughs> in addition to inventing what's now called the field of AI. Not to mention that he was trained as a psychologist and <laughs> did a few other things along the way. Actually, he also created the, the, the business school of uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon, which was uh, this sort of uh, um, part of his legacy. So um, this is actually just a random screenshot from Sprinkipia. Uh, but this is Russell Sprinkipia, not Newton Sprinkipia. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just so you know. Um, and as many of you might know, this was sort of a very ambitious thing that Bertrand Russell was doing. Um, but it, it was fundamentally flawed because of Gödel's incompleteness theorem. So, I mean, his whole logicism, the, the whole sort of enterprise of logicism that you can kind of create, have an axiomatic approach to codifying all of mathematics, sounds very appealing. And if you could do that, then of course computers could prove all the theorems in math, 
unfortunately, that's not quite true. <laughs> not so easy. Um, and so then we fast forward to, you know, uh, a few years later, by the time I got to campus, people were doing things like this. This is uh, the first driverless car. The Formula drove one across the country. It wasn't this one. This, I think, is now lab five. But um, around the time, you could see these types of uh, driver type vehicles running around campus. Um, and later on, he, he drove a uh, minivan. Uh, you should actually, I, I didn't think I'd have time for that, but it's a very cool sort of historic, uh, you know, thing. If you just Google Dean Pomerleau, um, uh, no hands across America, you will see a nice video clip on CNN of, uh, of, of that, which was, of course, very historic. And um, that, there's, there's, the, uh, uh, there's the minivan. And <clears throat> it's, it's kind of cool now that this stuff is becoming mainstream 20 years later. It's commercialized. Some of those people like Sebastian Thrun went off to Google. And of course, the rest is history, as they say. Um, but this is not stuff that I want to dwell on, because that's not what we're really uh, talking about. One of the other key milestones, of course, uh, is, you know, uh, speech recognition, um, you know, uh, Kasparov against Deep Blue. The, the, that, that was one of uh, somebody's uh, thesis that landed up at IBM and got commercialized. Um, uh, and, and of course, uh, Jeopardy later on. But now let's get back to finance and where this, uh, the, you know, how we might actually apply this. And so most of that fancy stuff that you hear about these days, all of that uh, sexy stuff tends to be in the sort of deep learning, uh, unsupervised, uh, on, on unstructured data, things of that nature. And for the most part, folks in finance like us who are doing fundamentally, you know, related things and equities, that's uh, not as relevant <laughs> for the most part, yeah. All right, where does um, where does Paul Shannon's fear and information paper fit into all this? <laughs> <laughs> not enough room in five slides. And okay. He wasn't, he wasn't carting him out. If you noticed, everybody I had oh, every yeah. <laughs> oh, <I see>. okay. <laughs> It was more like, you know, the history in five slides. Uh, as long as it's intersected with. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But, thank for, but thank you for pointing that out. So. What do you think it has to do with? I don't know. <laughs> it's not my field. Okay. Forty. I mean, forty-eight. What's your yes, it is. Much? Yeah. Okay. I don't think it is. What he did is AI. Oh, you know. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Is it more like a sort of Kelly batting information well, theory? Well, um, so Kelly afterwards did Kelly batting, yeah, but. Um, there's more, yeah, information theory is definitely Claude Shannon. So that's more about representing information. So like, so data compression, for example, <coughs> you could credit to Shannon. But, <clears throat> so it's about, Shannon is about, you know, is passing information through a noisy channel, okay? So um, like most, trying to be as efficient as possible to get the signal through. So it's, it's more electrical engineering, not so much this. Okay. Right. Yeah, so um, so what, what I guess where we really are for the most part, what folks still do in finance is pretty much in the domain of supervised. Uh, <coughs> um, of course, we've, we've been using some clustering algorithms and, you know, from, uh, PCA and stuff like that has been pretty standard in Wall Street for a while. Uh, everybody knows that, but uh, all the new stuff which really didn't exist in my time, things like uh, uh, LSTM and uh, what not. I mean, those, those are sort of the advances that have actually gained a lot of traction. So I'm not really <clears throat> putting this up out of the stabbing, but more to point out that there, there, there's a reason there was an AI winter in the 90s. A lot of the things that were being tried at the time, expert systems and automated theory improving, turned out to be kind of a dead end. We don't hear too much about that these days. And that's because the more statistical techniques have actually uh, ended up doing a lot better. Uh, that said, there isn't enough data in finance, at least for um, for equities uh, based on fundamentals, to do very much of a you know a deep learning type of stuff. So you would literally need a million year, a million years of closing prices to do much. I mean, yeah, of course you can just um, take data, but not on uh, fundamentals or closing prices. <coughs> um, so what what is the sort of landscape today? I mean, you know, segueing into finance, it's basically the Closest uh, to pure machine learning is, you know, when you think about what are the applications, there's obviously a lot of stuff on. I'm sorry, Jeff. You said literally a million years of data? Uh, yeah, because you would need enough data points, you know, enough closing prices to do deep learning. Uh, I mean, the, the, the trouble is that 
even one year of data, right? Like, I mean, most of the equity history goes back to, CompuStat goes to 1988, so that's pretty much the standard, you know, data set people have for fundamentals, and most of that's monthly. So actually, what you could train on if you were looking to do the usual stuff with factors and equity, you know, fundamentals, it's not much history at all. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, yeah, so mo mo most of, uh, uh, what's actually gotten traction uh, has, has been things like, uh, you know, natural language on, on social media, news, that's what some of these new alt data companies are doing. They're trying to read things like Yahoo Finance or chat, chat bots and, you know, uh, and, and mine uh, all kinds of text, whether it's uh, Fed or uh, earnings announcements, things of that nature. I'm sure you, you've run into other speakers talking about those types of applications. Um, uh, other other applications are obviously in the areas of uh, you know uh, whether it's uh, cash or options CDS you can do lots with with sort of pattern recognition that's closer to the usual uh, standard of context um, and then there's factor investing which is really what this talk is about so uh, you know there's there is actually a good bit you can do with supervised learning in the domain of smart betas and and uh, uh, factor investing, or call it going from smart betas to smart alphas. So that's actually what we're going to talk about now. And then there's a few other things like macro regime identification and so on and so forth. Okay, but just for historical perspective, so you know where how the industry has uh, advanced and how things keep getting commoditized. Well, in the beginning, before there was any single index model, I guess everything was just alpha. <laughs> there was no index. And then you got an index, that's cap M, and so a good chunk of it became beta, and the rest was called alpha, and then later on came Pharma French, um, that was roughly, what, 92? Um, yeah. And so then you had the, the style and size factors, and then, okay, so now you've got the market index, you've got S&P, and you've got, uh, you know, small versus large, and, um, and, and, uh, um, and, and the growth versus value, and then the rest is called alpha, and now where we are is, there's lots of folks that have hundreds of factors, as many papers being published with the uh, factor zoo. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so what's uh, clearly the alpha is shrinking. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> so the message is clearly that yesterday's alpha could be called today's beta. That's, that's uh, um, an ongoing debate. Um, and that happens to coincide with this enormous uh, migration towards passive instruments. I just came back from uh, an ETF conference with 3,000 people. And, Florida, so uh, that migration is well underway. And, and as, as you can imagine, there's no good reason really for assets to still be stuck in mutual funds, and lots of it's moving to uh, ETS for good reason. Um, but one could argue that maybe that's not the, uh, that's really not where it should all go, because most ETFs are uh, based on still kind of very simple cap-weighted indices, right? So if, if one could say that, well, cap-weighted indices are sort of uh, the not smart indices, the, uh, you know, then, then presumably there's smarter ways to construct them, and that's, that's uh, the smart beta label, okay? Um, <clears throat> and then our claim, our big sort of claim is that, of course, if you had enough of these smart betas or factors, then, uh, you know, if you sort of mathematically had a span, spanning set of these, then at least you could express any linear view um, in, in, on, on equity. Is there a distinction between smart betas and factors? Um, not really. I think it's just smart beta. Okay. <laughs> I'm not aware. <laughs> All right. I think somebody at AQR or someone came up with that. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, okay, so our version of uh, smart betas is basically we take about 600 factors. Um, obviously, 600 sounds better than 300, but really it's half because half of them are sector neutral. Um, and. Uh, and then we, uh, then we combine them into a bunch of uh, these smart betas. Um, right now we've got 18 of them. I'll probably make it 20 just to have a nice round number. Uh, we'll stop at 18. Um, but the idea is that normally in academic studies when people talk about factors, they really mean the top minus bottom quintile or sometimes tercile. Um, uh, but the way we do it, because this is very applied, 
Uh, it's really meant for fundamental, which means fundamental folks who want to do some dis sort of uh, come, you know, hybrid combination of uh, uh, quantum stress training. So we actually take the extreme tail, which is the top minus bottom five percent, and we look at the performance spread and the uh, and, and the information coefficients and all of that for that very extreme tail. Right. So if you, if you if you do well, if you do the ICs, you capture the entire list, of course. So you, you know what's happening for the entire uh, rank order. But if you take the extreme tails, then it's obviously going to be juicier. But then you know the alpha will be more sort of uh, pronounced, it'll be more exacerbated. But you can also have some um, outliers, right? So you, you're going to be more uh, affected by the outliers, so to speak. Um, okay. So that's how we define our factors. Right, so everybody's clear on the definition, that's very important. Um, and then the, the trick is to formulate them in different ways. Now, for the most part, up until now, nobody's really been doing this. That's not been the focus of the industry. So even the folks that have done this, like Rob Arnott and, and uh, Jeremy Siegel, et cetera, they've done a few of the, you know, well, instead of cap weighting, why don't we dividend weight it? Or why don't we? So th that's been the thrust of essentially what's uh, the, the innovation thus far. Now, of course, there are hedge funds and prop desks that were doing lots of these factors for a while, and that's what we're sort of trying to you know, democratize and commoditize. Mm -hmm. um, but the big twist is this, right? So uh, <clears throat> it's, it's the, the big kind of claim here, which I think is a bit different and novel, is that we're saying the portfolio construction aspect of how you formulate the smart beta is actually very non-trivial. And, and it makes a humongous difference the outcome. And I'll show you why in just a second, because if you just take sort of your naive benchmark for each of these smart betas, right? So for whether it's PE or PB or 12 month price amount or, or any such thing, we'll, we'll see very soon that it makes an enormous difference um, whether you take that naive benchmark or the particular construct that we might choose. Okay, so the idea is we're going to take all these factors, right? So there's hundreds of them, and we're going to take dozens of them, plug it into a certain cohort, and then we'll combine it in some manner, maximize the sharp, or do a risk parity, all those fun things you've learned from optimization. And then once we've got all the smart betas, we'll combine them further into signals, okay? So basically, the signals are like a hedge fund that you can run off the shelf. If you have the signal, you can basically, you know, run something pretty. Uh, pretty amazing, or you could certainly choose to bet on any one of these, just like an, uh, just like an ETF. Okay, um, and, and let, let's bear in mind these are not pure factor constructs, right? So some people try to do the orthogonalization, and they essentially want to make sure that their value is stripped uh, clean of any influence from other factors. So we're not doing that here. Mm -hmm. This is just we're combining a whole bunch of flavors of value and based on risk parity or something, and that's, that's what comes out of it. Okay, there's no attempt to orthogonize. And there's, there's a good reason for that, because we're not doing this for purposes of attribution. At the end of the day, we want to do these sort of fully integrated uh, factor combinations. And I'm using some sort of technical terms here. Fully integrated refers to the debate between, uh, so there's again, a bit of a debate between the AQR and the r not camp as to whether one should take Linear combination of the factors, which is called mixing, or full integration, which means basically you take the weighted average of the factor ranks, but then you re rank the whole thing, and that's a whole new sort of top minus bottom. It's, it's different than, do you guys follow? Mm -hmm. So there's a big difference between taking the weighted average of a bunch of factors, right? Because in that case, you're actually investing in, so let's say you have n factors, and, mm -hmm. and you cho choose to equal weight all n factors. Now you, the output, so the outcome will now just be the weighted average of the performance of the individual portfolios, and it means you have to run each factor as a separate portfolio, as opposed to full integration means you've combined all the factors in the first place, so you're getting the intersection set of those best stocks, whatever qualifies as top five percent in in uh, this expression of value. So let's suppose you got PE and you got enterprise to this, even to that. You got all these flavors, cash flow yield, so you're gonna combine all of them, right? But after you combine them and effectively take the intersection across all of these different uh, parameters, then you take the top minus bottom. And the answer can be very different. So that's a raging debate. Um, 
Okay, so now let's go to, I'm not going to bore you with the plant right here, but this mm -hmm. basically gives you a sense of what's actually inside the cohorts. Uh, so for the, once you get the top five and bottom five, yeah. how do you generate the weights? The signal will only give the direction, right? Um, no, the, the actual names, right? So you know the tickers uh, of the companies that are in the top five, those are the ones you're wrong, and then you just short the ones in the bottom five. So it's pretty simple. Weightage for the individual stuff, how do you decide? Ah, great question. Okay, so some folks like AQR do cap weighting. Normally, I think in the factory literature, and please correct me, Peter, if I'm wrong, um, I believe it's equally weighted normally. Uh, that's how we do it. But, again, bear in mind, we're doing something else here too. There's all this risk parity and other stuff going on. So, <laughs> um, But yes, in, in general, let's suppose you've got top 5%, so in our case it happens to be roughly 2,500 liquid names, which is US, Canadians, ADRs, anything that's gap accounting, consistent, you know, trades on a major US exchange, subject to institutional um, liquidity and turnover constraints. So 2,500 names, 5% means you got 125 long, 125 short, equal weight thing. Easy peasy, right? Okay. So let's just take one of these. So <clears throat> like a very popular um, smart beta, uh, which used to be quite important to many quant hedge funds, is something like analyst revisions. This is the sort of thing that lots of quants have traded over time. So what does analyst revisions include? It's going to have all kinds of things like you know, um, standardized unexpected earnings surprise, or you know, change in consensus, or uh, uh, diffusion measures on up versus down of, of, of analyst revisions or you know you could do the same with ratings and targets and all that type of stuff right so you can imagine there's so many different ways to do these things and, and that's pretty much what's happening in, in each of these cohorts right so um, take something like earnings stability well I shouldn't say earnings because stability and there's actually earnings cash flow um, revenues uh, margins all kinds of things in there right uh, so this this was the smart beta that did best last year, 21%. Um, so again, the, the point is, is there's many ways to measure any of these um, uh, thematic, uh, you know, uh, to express the theme, and the trick is how you come back. Okay, so I'll skip this slide because you guys know how to combine things and take weighted averages. <laughs> um, all right. Um, okay, so. <clears throat> Back to the claim. I, I told you that portfolio construction matters, which in this case really means signal construction, because you don't have portfolio yet. You're just taking equal weighted long minus short. There's no optimization yet. There's no, right? Like in, in, in the real world, you may choose to optimize to certain things. You might say you've got a, you've got a certain vol bogey. You want to target 10% vol and, you know, one and a half sharp or something like that. That's, that's not happening yet. We haven't done any of that. Um, so, all we're saying is that how we construct the signal out of the factors matters. It's not good enough to just take the 12 month price momentum because that was the Jagdish Shetman paper and everybody knows about it and 27 years later it doesn't work, <laughs> right? So the point is that a lot of these factors have been published for quite a while. That was one of the first ones and obviously it's a horrendous factor now. It doesn't work. It's actually this first one over here. So you can see from the box whisker plot that it's got terrible, you know, this nasty left tail, lots of huge crashes. So, you know, anytime you see press coverage about quants, there's usually something about momentum crash and the quants are getting us killed again. And <laughs> it's always their fault. <laughs> um, but that's this fact that the media usually talks about. Now, it turns out there's other factors that are much better behaved. So if you look at numbers uh, 10 through 12 on the right side, they don't have those nasty crashes. They seem a little better behaved. Uh, and that's really the point, right? So you, you could have different formulations of the same concept which behave very differently. And, and that's why um, uh, one can do a lot better. So for instance, in, 2000, <coughs> in 2008, you can see that when the market was crashing, momentum as a factor did really well. Um, now, can anyone guess why that might be the case? You might think, well, the market's crashing, momentum should get killed. But actually, that's not true at all. And I'm asking this because I just want to make sure everybody understands these are market neutral factors. <laughs> that's the key, right? 
Yeah. So the, the reason that momentum does well in a crash is obviously because the short side kicks in, right? So everything's market neutral, meaning dollar neutral. You could make it beta neutral. In fact, I'll show you later. It makes an enormous difference if you whether you're beta neutral in a bull market or a bear market, <laughs> as opposed to dollar neutral. Um, but yeah, you would expect momentum to do well in, in a market crash, and of course it does in 2008. But you know what I hinted at: the enhanced versions of momentum that have the better behave factors obviously do better than than a simple momentum. But where it really makes a much much larger difference is coming out of the inflection point. So in 2009, lots of quants got killed, and this is after they got killed in 2007 in August. I'm sure everybody remembers that. Um, so that was a very different phenomenon. It had nothing to do with the typical momentum crashes. That was a liquidation episode. Um, but in, in 2009, you got the real sort of the largest drawdown in, in, in momentum ever, and that's because as you've got the V-shaped recovery in the market. The, the names that are typically on the short side of the list tend to move up the fastest. And, and that's, that's the unfortunate thing about uh, compounding, mm -hmm. which <laughs> doesn't help you when you short stuff. So, um, so you can see that you know, uh, the traditional momentum factor did very poorly. It was down 72% on a market neutral basis. You might say, well, if I want something, short something, how can I be done that much? <laughs> Unfortunately, it can happen. <laughs> um, and, and on the other hand, the enhanced momentum uh, didn't do as badly, but still pretty bad, minus 36 versus 72. But it's a pretty substantial difference. And you can see the same in 2016 when Citadel was liquidating in February of uh, 16, um, right around this time, actually, in the last week of Jan, uh, early Feb. We had a similar phenomenon. So the point is that it's possible to uh, dramatically outperform if you, you know, pick the right factors and do your uh, signal construction right. So let's let's you know use some more evidence to kind of demonstrate that. We're gonna look at last 20 years. We happen to be fortunate that sitting here right now you got 20 clean years of data from 2000 until end of 19. That's a very nice clean data set. And based on the 20 years, um, it, it turns out so let's just look at the annualized numbers by the benchmarks or the naive benchmark against each of these um, factor constructs, right? So in, in the case of profitability, well, the obvious thing to look at is something like return on equity or assets or something like that, right? So well, good old ROE did pretty well, it did 10.85, that's not a bad return at all, um, with uh, close to half sharp, except that in this case it turns out that had you just equal weighted a bunch of different versions of profitability, you could have done a lot better. So your sharp would have gone up from 0.46 to 1.3. That's not shabby at all. The Sordina would have actually <laughs> gone up a lot more, 3.7. So it, it turns out, and, and of course, how we do this one has to be very careful because it's very easy to have look ahead bias and, and fool yourself into thinking you've done something amazing. Um, but uh, so the way, and, and obviously there's lots of different ways to do this. You can you can do all sorts of you can do your bagging and boosting, and we'll show you some examples later, or, or uh, other types of machine learning techniques, or just a simple optimization that I showed here. Right. So one is risk parity, solving for equal risk. Um, one is let's try to maximize the sharp. Another is well, why don't we get rid of the bad bad guys first and just look at the subsets of the best factors based on sharp or uh, or, or Q returns up until that point. But again, the most important thing is a time T. One must uh, make sure that you're not using any data that you didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to make sure that whatever this means, best sharp or, or highest return or all of that stuff is up, to, up until T minus one. Yeah. So the first one, so you're saying you're choosing the portfolio or the stock to represent the highest percent percentile <coughs> in the ROE. Yes. How often do you rebalance? I mean, if you reinvestigate re the ROE, it could be different from one after a year later. So yes. you would rebalance the composition. Like how frequently do you say? Is it once a year or monthly? Monthly. Every month. So every single one you revisit the ROE yes. ranking, yes. you pick the ones that are at the top That's right. five percent. Yeah. And you also short the ones that are the bottom five percent. Absolutely. Yeah, so the entire factor is being recomposed every month end. Right. So you observe your list 
tomorrow on Jan 31st, we pull that portfolio from Feb 1st well, yeah. and rebalance again. So. And like all these different choices, I mean, I would assume that some of them end up having more turnover month by month than others do, I would assume, right? Absolutely, yes. So as, as you point out, um, some of the more fundamental factors will be very slow moving. Actually, quality type stuff doesn't move fast. I mean, how much are your margins going to change? Usually margins for companies are pretty sticky, right? We're talking about long cycles there. Um, but things like analyst revisions, ratings and targets, those are pretty volatile factors. I mean, going into the quarter, uh, the relative rankings of analyst revisions can change quite dramatically. Um, and, and in fact, I would argue that for those faster moving factors, our monthly results are substantially understated because we, we can show you for live data that if you took daily against monthly, it makes an enormous difference. So last year, for instance, if I had some factor or like even stability, which was up 21% on a daily re-rank of the factors would only have been up, I don't know, maybe 12 or something on monthly. So it, it, makes, it makes a big difference. And something like analyst revisions makes it much, much, usually factor two. <laughs> um, yeah. What's the definition of hit rate? Uh, just percent, I believe that's <clears throat> percent of positive months. Okay. So 53% of the 240 observations. Okay. And they're all about 50%. Um, yes. Because these are all good factors. Okay. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Um, as usual, nobody showed the back test with bad factors. So. <laughs> okay. Right. Sorry. Was there another Did question? Did you see uh, ROD? Is that the return on equity? Yes. Um, so the equity is the book value, not the profit cap. The, the return for the return on equity. I know, so I don't think it's book value. It's not book value, it's market cap. Right, well, it's, uh, yeah. Then it would depend on the price change of things that they need. Well, it's, yes, a lot of the factors will have price change embedded in them, yes. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, and then that does actually make some of them a little noisier, but that's, that's fine. Normally, we think there's some information in price. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> okay, so uh, the interesting thing actually, the reason the profitability bucket is so interesting is because normally you would think that if we're doing all this fancy footwork, risk parity, whatnot, we should get a better answer. But it turns out actually equal weighted is the best answer. Mm -hmm. And that's very surprising. That doesn't normally happen. But the reason it's, it's the case here, any guesses? Okay, so the reason in this particular cohort um, equal weight wins is because all the factors are good and they're somewhat uncorrelated. So equal weighting them it turns out to be very compelling because you're getting the benefits of the correlation sort of, you know, pick up and also then you might say, well, but why couldn't I have just done top three and <coughs> turn benefited because all the other factors are also quite useful. That's the point. Um, in general, that's not the case. In, in, many, in most cases, equal weight does not win. And, and you can see that in the next uh, one for capital usage. So we have the score called cap usage slash cap structure related. And so here we've got all sorts of things like you know buybacks and total yield and capex to something and <laughs> uh, all types of factors that relate either to the capital structure of the company or the nature of the cash and the balance sheet and capital usage, et cetera. OK. So in this case, you can see equal weighted does fine, but um, it, it, it's much better to take the top three by return and just equal weight them. Okay, and, and so my real point was that whenever, just like with the momentum bucket, whenever there's a dispersion in this and the bad guys, you want to drop those. That's the idea. Okay, so let's uh, look at uh, let's look at P and PB. Um, it turns out P does pretty well by itself, but Using this framework, we can now improve it pretty dramatically by over 50% on the return side, you know, from 12 to 19. So that's not too shabby. Sharp just about doubles. Uh, Certina just about doubles. Not bad at all. Um, uh, and, and, you know, we also show you the long only side, which means forget about shorting. Let's suppose you're a mutual fund. You can only hold the, the long side, so you just take the top of the list and go to the bottom. Um, okay. Yeah, so dollar neutral or? Uh, oh no, that's just the long. Yeah. 
just along. Just free balancing, 100% blonde. Um, okay. Which actually is very relevant to folks. So let's suppose you're a wealth manager at UBS, and all you do is run, you know, accounts for mom and pop. That's all you care about. And let's say because, like, say part of that return is just, just interest on your money, right? Like, I mean, because you're putting money in, and so let's say you should expect some return. Yes. Just that. So, okay. Yes. Okay. So I I think what Professor Carr is saying that we we have not actually done the sharp ratio carefully. So that this the, for, for the long only side, it's just uh, mu over sigma. Yeah. Well, it's in minus over sigma. Yeah, so we, right. we don't actually right. take out the risk-free there. Yeah, right. Thank you for pointing that yeah. out. Um, okay, yeah. Um, I mean, basically, the point is, it, it, it's just there to show you which method is better, but you should do it more carefully. Okay. <laughs> the, the way that it's in your textbook. Um, in, in the long short case, it doesn't matter because it's a self financing proposal. Yeah, so. I agree. Uh, okay, so deep, deep value. Uh, deep value, you can see that actually this is interesting because here you can see that, you know, good old price to book, which most value managers, you know, uh, worship at the ultra of. This is the stuff that all value people think is so great. Well, over 20 years, really hasn't done that much. <laughs> I mean, one and a half percent. <laughs> You could have, could have done much better holding <laughs> T-bills. <laughs> so, um, but it, it turns out that you can do a lot better with, with one of our other uh, methodologies, like uh, in this case, the top three cubes. So uh, that's, that's the idea. Now, this is again all, oh, wait a sec. So I, I didn't uh, mention that it uh, looks like these slides are already beta neutral. So I apologize. There's just so many slides floating around. Mm -hmm. um, these numbers are actually beta neutral. OK. So that, that means there's another subtlety in here. It doesn't affect the long side at all, but it just means that when we calculate the spread returns, we have to first beta neutralize it. And of course, beta neutralizing could mean one of several things. It could, it could mean that you either lever uh, one side up to match the other side, or you delever the other side to match the uh, first side, or you could uh, lever both up to one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you understand, right? I mean, the, the point is that for most factors, there's going to be a huge mismatch, especially for so take low, something like low ball, right? So you, you know what low ball means? It literally means pick the lowest fall guys. Well, if you pick the lowest fall stocks, obviously they'll have very low beta. There'll be a humongous yeah. mismatch. And this is beta with respect to what? As the of 100? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Just the market beta. Okay. So everything, it's not against its own portfolio or something. It's okay. Okay. Um, so the, the trouble is that most of the times there'll be a humongous beta mismatch between the long and short side, which means that the dollar neutral portfolio actually has a substantial embedded market component in it. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so it, it does help to beta neutralize, but again, you have to be very careful that the beta is not with look ahead bias. You can't just say, well, 20 years later, I know the <laughs> realized beta, let me, let me neutralize with that. Um, so that's 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 the usual in sample out sample. You got to be careful uh, about look at bias. So these numbers are already beta neutralized, and obviously that means that some factors actually benefit tremendously, some don't. It turns out in the case of the value, if you were to dollar neutralize it, the numbers would be a lot higher. So this 17 to 16.8 would be closer to 21 point change because um, value factors usually benefit because the long side has has higher beta, right? So usually you're getting sort of beaten down companies that are more volatile. On so the other hand, sorry, no uh, isn't the goal to be both dollar neutral and beta neutral? No, so the, the, there are two different ways to display the same information. Okay. So I could have shown you the same exact chart with dollar neutral, in which case instead of 17% Oh, so this is not dollar neutral, just beta neutral. Yeah, this is only okay. beta neutral. I okay. noticed that in, in my okay, I got title. It. Okay. It says beta neutral. Okay. I forgot that I used to have slides that were dollar neutral. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> but it looks like uh, my, my colleague inserted the beta neutral slide. So, um, okay. the, the, the point is that it makes a big difference. And some factors will benefit, some will get hurt. Okay, so in, in the beta neutral case, it turns out deep value does much worse. You go down from 21 to 17, but there are other factors like, you know, low ball that will do a lot better. Actually, it's, it's a humongous difference because, you know, obviously low ball the beta mismatch is so extreme that if you don't beta neutralize it, uh, it there's not much of an anomaly. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so we're back to momentum now. You can see once again that 
you know, uh, things have really gotten hard since that first paper. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, it's, it's actually negative uh, trailing 20 years now. Uh, on the other hand, you can do some of these things like risk parity and whatnot and get a much better number, but it's, uh, it's, it's still really nothing much to write home about. Uh, because this is 5% annualized without any T cost or market impact or <laughs> yeah. all the real world fi frictions of financing, and you know you could easily spend 5% just uh, paying the prime broker. <laughs> 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 so it's it's um, um, it's not that great. Um, <clears throat> size, well, size isn't by the way. Size for us is not just market cap, so. It's not as trivial as there's other proxies of firm size, like number of employees, or there's all, you can come up with all sorts of things. So um, that's how we managed to juice it up. But if, if it was just market cap, then you would pretty much just get nothing, zero. Right. <laughs> um, OK, so now let's just look at the whole list. And once again, this is beta neutral, 20, more, 20 years trailing. And you can see, OK, profitability looks really good. Um, things like leverage, which might just be debt to equity or something like that and then, you know just simple balance sheet stuff um, also works pretty well um, relative value the de deep value we talked about those things cap structure um, the safety risk is just low ball so on a very neutral basis actually low ball does pretty well 12.3 annualized with uh, really good sharp so ball is low you can see that um, um, yeah by reading that yes correctly yes 1.3 sharp is pretty good actually. In fact, it's the uh, second highest in the list. Um, so yeah, now the, the, the interesting thing is there are, there are ones down here where you can't do a whole lot with dividends because you're actually shorting half the universe. Mm -hmm. right, so half of the <coughs> stocks don't pay a dividend, which means that on a, on a beta neutral basis, <coughs> it's not a great factor because you're shorting a lot of things, and you're along a very selective list. So it, it actually does pretty well on the long side, it just doesn't do that great on, on a market neutral basis. Okay, so marching right along. All right, so now I've, sh I've shown you a whole bunch of uh, the more traditional methods, risk parity and optimized and max sharp and so on. <coughs> you might say, well, can we do some bagging or boosting? And well, of course, why not? Um, it turns out most people in the industry don't care too much about this stuff yet because they find it too, <laughs> um, too opaque, okay. and I don't blame them. Um, but we, so we, we have a couple of slides just to give you a sense, and since you're students, you might find it more interesting. Um, um, all right, so as you, as you can imagine, a forest has to have trees, and so a random forest could also be called an ensemble <laughs> of, of learners in each tree gives you a prediction, and then you somehow average it out, right? That's the simple idea. So you get some voting mechanism across them, and you come up with one out. Right? So in this case, uh, we've got majority voting, and that, that's what's going to give you the answer. Um, um, and so there are other things, of course, you have to worry about. You may want to randomize your features in order to do this, this bias variance trade-off that I'm sure you've, you've heard about in your stats classes, and so that's the big problem. And, and machine learning is how to manage that, and you know one could choose to randomize the uh, uh, subsamples and, and you know pick different features, things like that. So we ran one particular case uh, for growth. Why? Because as as you know, most uh, papers are published in value, not growth, because usually the growth factors don't do that well. Value factors do better in the long term. Um, but it turns out, and so that's this that's the orange line. If you just took some, you know, some <coughs> of growth or even equal weighted a bunch of them, you wouldn't see much of a return at all. And in this case, what we're trying to demonstrate is that if, if I was to somehow uh, train this random forest, you could get a much better answer. Okay. What does CLS stand for? Uh, classifier. Okay. So uh, very important to note that this random forest is just a classifier. So in this case, we don't have a sort of cardinal ranking like in most. Uh, multi-factor models, right? So all the factor stuff we've been doing is what's called a multi-factor sort of approach. And, and there, you, every stock has some rank, and you can say 100 percentile, 99th, and so on, right? Um, in this case, that's not true, because we're just classifying very high level. And there's only, uh, in this particular instance, we just took three labels, right? 
So you're just doing one, zero, minus one. Stock is an outperform, an underperform, or neutral. Just like an analyst would put a rating. And so you're going to train it on. Now notice this starts in 2005. Why? Because, any guesses? Um, well, you need to train it on something. So we need the first five years to train the random forest. And we're going to, in this case, actually, I tell you the answer. It's done on a rolling five-year basis. So it's not an expanding window. But you can try that, too, and see if it's better. So we do a rolling five year, and we just retrain the um, forest every quarter, and then predict for the next quarter, and keep going. Right? Very simple. Um, and in, in so doing, first we're training on the you know uh, in sample what what type of run performed, and then you know we make the prediction, and then we just report the top stocks versus the bottom stocks, take the spread. Once again, that's the answer. But this is a bit different. Remember, in the other case we took the top five percentile here. Here we're taking all the ones as the longs and we're shorting all the minus ones. Okay, okay. and then there's some other technicalities which um, we don't need to get into, but obviously you have to sort of tune the hyperparameters, worry about things like the number of nodes and max depth and all of these sorts of things, which the software code these days. <laughs> you don't even have to do it yourself. Is there any fundamental reason for the test rate split for the five years and the one quarter prediction? Is there any fundamental reason for that? Um, well, it's really a bit of an art science, right? I mean, the, the, it's, it's, but I'll, I'll let uh, anyone else uh, who has strong opinions. I mean, I'm, I'm it's common with monthly data to use five years, right? It's just, no. Yeah, I mean, you could use three years. You could use. You can use. In fact, that's what. The parameter tuning is about. You can try all sorts of different. I mean, all of these could be considered hyperparameters that you must tune. The number of nodes. What's the rolling window? Should it be an expanding window? Should it be? Should I have a hundred trees in the forest? I mean, so you can you can run all of those cases just like in you know when we used to do Monte Carlo on options pricing, and you could try all different <laughs> you know millions of paths and different combinations. Well, it's the same idea. Well, sorry. You do something like exponentially uh, moving out of it. Of course, uh, of course. You basically just discount the data from the past more and more. Yeah, you can certainly choose to do an exponential. Yeah, absolutely. And that's really part of the sort of um, art of experimentation. I, I, as far as I know, there's no a priori <laughs> reason to favor one against the other. And that's really the problem with, with this type of machine learning is it's very prone to overfitting, right? I mean, you can, you can run all of those tricks and somebody might choose a 17 day with a, a certain lambda for their exponential moving average and, okay. yeah. Um, why that should work out sample is uh, <laughs> for you to judge. Um, okay, so this is just sort of uh, hand waving um, at one of the other applications. So we've talked a lot about uh, um, smart betas and how to combine them into uh, signals and portfolios, and I wonder if this is out of sequence. Yeah, it's kind of out of sequence, so uh, I'll, I'll be back to smart betas in just a second. Um, but let, let me just uh, hint at other applications. So this is something we used to do within our, uh, within our hedge fund. We basically created this GUI just to show our, our investors how one might do machine learning for macro regimes if you want to identify. So ideally what you want to do is to connect the bottom-up stock picking with the top-down macro stuff, right? So if, if there's a way to marry the two, that would be nice. And that's the idea. But the trouble is, first, you have to identify the regime. <laughs> so how do we identify the regime? And, and that's a whole different story. But it, it, one can use these types of techniques, actually, Quark, for instance, to um, you can feed all these you know, macro variables instead, things you get from the Fred and such websites. And, uh, and, and you can tell it, you know, oil prices and stock prices and credit spreads and tech spreads and VIX and all those sorts of things, right? And, and hopefully your, your tree will spit out a number that says risk on, risk off, or some state of the world that maps into your, uh, uh, your, your, your factor timing and tilting. Okay, so now I'm actually back to, uh, back to the heat map. So I gave you one picture of the 20 year smart betas. Now I'm just going to give you a sense of what actually happened last year. So as many of you remember, last year was um, actually very 
uneventful for the first uh, eight months, um, seven months, absolutely nothing happened in Factorland. <laughs> there was yeah. almost no volatility and the market just sort of, uh, you know, came, came out of the December lows in 18, 26 December, or 24th, I think Christmas Eve was the, uh, was, was the bottom and it went streaming higher from there and everything was just sort of uh, all rosy. Um, and, and of course, uh, then we got to August, uh, uh, momentum continued to go up dramatically, value continued to plunge, and then towards the end of August, from the, from the 28th of August onwards, in about three weeks, we got a, a six, seven sigma uh, rotation. So we had a very uh, substantial sort of uh, earthquake in factor land when all of a sudden people had been asleep, woke up and realized something was going on. Um, Momentum was crashing 25%, value was up close to 25, so it was a pretty substantial move. By the end of the year, what we see is that actually, according to us, our version of enhanced momentum on a beta neutral basis with daily re ranks of the factors, okay? So there's some technical details buried in here which are actually quite important that um, the cohorts are being re optimized only once a month, right? So we're not, when you do the risk parity or Max Sharp, we're only re-optimizing at month end, as, as you observed earlier, um, but, uh, but we're refreshing the factors each day, okay? In other words, you already know what the linear combination of factors are within that cohort, but we're actually still, but you don't know what the factor ranks are gonna be tomorrow, right? So you could either choose to keep the ranks constant for the entire month, which will not be to your benefit, <laughs> Or you can you can continue to rebalance because there's new information coming along, yeah, and obviously during earnings season or when there's lots of news, that makes a huge difference. All right, so that's what's going on is we we freeze the factor weights and the factor composition in the beginning, but we continue to daily channeling the returns based on the re-rankings of the factors each day as news comes in, and that makes a huge difference. So something like analyst revisions. Um, you can see, you know, you got a 12%, uh, wait, is that 12? 12% uh, 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 beta neutral year to date spread. Now, on a monthly spread, that's going to be actually half as much. It'll be a, a less than six. But because we've gotten the benefit of the daily re ranks, we do a lot better on something like analyst revisions. Which factors did the best last year? Well, it turns out stability, as I mentioned earlier, was really quite good. And you, you might notice that it wasn't that great because of the long side, actually the long side 30.8 is just in line with the S&P last year on a total return basis, but it's really the shorts that are uh, doing all the work for you. So essentially all the alpha came from the short side in this particular, um, in this particular uh, smart beta. Um, let's look at um, risk, which is our logo. Once again, you'll notice that the numbers are quite astounding on a beta neutral basis, up 20%, but uh, the longs are actually dramatically lagging. The longs are only up 20, and yet you make 20% because the shorts are really pretty amazing. <laughs> so, you, once again, all the alpha is coming from the short side. What's the meaning of risk here? Uh, low ball. Low ball. <coughs> so, we, we call it the risk smart beta, but most people call it low ball. Okay. Um, okay, so it's portfolio sorted on the, uh, the volatility of the securities? Yes, okay. different measures, of, so that cohort's gonna have different factors such as three-year beta, five-year beta, you know, idiosyncratic wall, uh, some, uh, yeah, just okay. different expressions of Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's why we call it risk, because usually what other folks do it, like AQR, they just take one measure of ball. That's why they call it low ball, because the tops are the low ball stocks, but mm -hmm. we're, we're not just doing ball, we're actually doing quite a few um, okay. flavors. Okay, um, so yeah, and, and then of course you can see at the top of the list that uh, you know um, value had a pretty bad year. That shouldn't be news to anyone. So well, what's been happening lately is that you know uh, just like in 1999, all the growth stocks have uh, the growth momentum complex has been doing rather well, um, and, and the uh, so-called value names keep getting cheaper. <laughs> um, Obviously, that may not be sustainable. In fact, in the month of Jan, that's got much more exacerbated, and so you, you might wonder. Okay. Um, actually, worth pointing out the profitability, which was the highest uh, historically, did pretty well this year too, 14 and a half. Uh, cap structure, which is another good one, did pretty well this year too, 11 and change. 
Um, so okay, that's that's sort of the uh, year to date um, story. Um, oh, this is uh, this is the dollar neutral. So I actually do have the slide, and you can see what I was saying earlier that analyst revision is only six percent here. Yeah. Right. So remember, it was twice as much on a beta neutral basis, only six percent. You can see stability has come down from twenty one to. Uh, 21 to 18, so there are certain factors that benefit pretty substantially. Basically, all defensive factors, whether the longs have lower beta, will benefit for obvious reasons. Okay, I think I made this point. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, we're going to have to wrap up. Time. There's, uh, there's a class in here. It's okay, class. all right, so I can wrap it up. Um, okay. I, I just have some ideas. So yeah, that's pretty much, uh, you know, this is uh, just more of the same on a 20 year basis, and this is okay, now you combine it into various signals, and you can see some of them do really well. If you take seven uncorrelated clusters, you get the sizzling seven. That was up almost 25% last year. Um, this is on a dollar neutral basis. It's not as good. Um, you can now do the bottom up and get a sector rotation model out of it. You can throw the rank correlation, return correlations, and start to see the clusters. And you know you can then run your k-means on it and say, OK, well, did he actually do this right? <laughs> um, um, and I'll skip the whole LBO part. So. Yeah, how's that? Okay, well, okay. all right, well, thank you. Okay. If I can just end on this note. Oh, yeah, um, So, I had to put in a plug for sure. Quaff and you. Uh, Professor Carr was kind enough to come and speak to us in December, and I hope that you'll come and listen to Greg Zuckerman talking about uh, the Jim Simon's book. This should be a really good event for all, all who want to know about Renaissance. Yeah, is it yeah. free for students? Um, uh, we, we, we can make it free for students, that's okay. not supposed to be, usually we try to manage the, <laughs> but definitely for your students. Just for candy students. Okay. <laughs> well, only for your students. Right. Okay, that's good. Okay. Um, yeah, so do you own the book? Um, well, it's a book signing, so I believe they'll have the books there, you can get them to sign it. Okay, you buy the book and have I, it. I, I think that's the, uh, that's the idea, I haven't talked to the publisher more than so. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I bought the book. I'm reading it, it's fine. Yeah. yeah. But I'm sure you'll sign it if you're... You think Jim Simons will be there? Well, <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> I wish. So do I. Um, Dan actually tried to get uh, his classmate David Magnum there. Right? Oh, yeah. Um, so, I, I think this yeah. will be a really amazing event. If, have, have any of you read the book yet? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. So, is he giving a, like, a talk? It's just a book signing, right? Like, no, he's going to talk about some of the vignettes. Oh, he is. And, okay. And, and it'll, it'll, it'll be very interactive, so you can you can you can read the book, bring your questions, or. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that's a thought. So, I'll try to read it before February. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. All right. Very good. Well, thanks again. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. So. Um,